talk about now is caucus. Uh, we finished up mediator's opening statement, party's opening statement, gone through joint discussion. Now we're setting up our caucus. Caucus is primarily a probing the future. We've moved from the past to the present. We're going to kind of push, gently push, lure, entice, whatever word you want to use, into the future. Before we get too far, let's set the background, talk about our definition of mediation. We put this at the beginning of all the presentations, just in case you were primarily interested in caucus. We can give you um, pulled that off the shelf and started watching it, gives you a context of what we're talking about. We're talking about mediation and the way we approach it, it's a uh, process that empowers people to make an informed decision in their own best interest. So we're pretty much going through the empowerment process and it's here at the caucus that we're going to do a pivot point where we're moving into and generating those own self-interest issues for the parties. Uh, so that when they come to a decision making, we're going to do reconvening and agreement writing, they can make that informed decision. So right here, we move from empowerment into own best interest, and then we're headed for the decision making part of the process. In fact, let's look at the steps. These are the steps to the process that we're going through. MOS, mediator's opening statement. PAUSE, party's opening statement. JD, joint discussion, we just finished. And now, caucus. We're going to have a caucus with the complainant and a caucus with the respondent, a private meeting, if you will. And we're headed into reconvening together and then agreement writing. Now, in terms of the process steps, there's a temporal um, association here with this. Um, in the PAUSE, party's opening statement, we recognized and talked about that we were pretty much located in the past. Parties are stuck there usually. That's why you're there. They've had, they got a conflict. They're stuck in the past, positioned in the past. And then we're going to move through, we move through joint discussion into the present, and then now we're headed for the future. So it goes something like this. Parties opening statement, pretty much the past, but we're looking a little bit toward the present. With joint discussion, well, we may go back and visit the past a little bit, but we're moving into, and a lot of the focus is going to be here and now, the dynamics that are taking place and how they're communicating that power of the present focus. And then caucus, we may go back and visit the past again. We may even discuss some present issues, but we're pushing, uh, luring, enticing, whatever word, to address the future, trying to get the parties to change their focus to address what's going to happen in the future. That's your responsibility here, and caucus is where this takes place, where it can be most effectively done. So, positioned in the past, parties opening statement, joint discussion, the power of the present, and caucus probing the future. You have no idea how hard I resisted throwing in probing the possibilities and keeping the PPP alliteration. alliteration. Uh, but I did fight it. I won that battle, and it's probing the future. I thought too many Ps was just going to get too, uh, too uh, you know, hokey. So here we are. It's probing the future. All right. Now, we finished joint discussion. Remember, got our transition. For whatever reason now, I've made a decision as the mediator to head for caucus. Uh, the parties have wound down, they keep repeating themselves, there's some sense I've gotten all the information I think I can get from them and the questions. I've effectively addressed uh, a present focus because I've used the notes effectively and gotten where I needed to be and gotten the parties where they need to be. For whatever reason, I'm off to caucus. Here's the transition I'll use. If I have to, I'll interrupt them even if they're getting volatile. Well, there's a good reason to go to caucus. Excuse me, let me interrupt you for a moment. I'm going to jump into this transition. If you will recall, in my opening statement, remember, that's why it's there. I can go back and refer to it. It's not me, it's the process calling for a caucus. In my opening statement, I said there would be a time for me to meet with each of you privately. This would be a good time to do that. Now, Whenever we do a demonstration role play and the parties start to get kind of volatile and it's the signal, well, it's time to go to caucus, and I step in and say this, this would be a great time. It always gets a chuckle. It's funny in a role play. In a real mediation, it's not that funny. Oftentimes, I'll say, this would be a good time. This would be a good time for that, for that meeting. And immediately, boom, someone stands up and they're stomping for the door. Okay? Let me escort you out. Okay, that's going to be my last line. Let's, let me escort you out. Now, I'm not going to sit there. Let's talk about escorting. I'm not going to sit there and point to the door, you know, and don't let it hit you on the way out. No, I'm going to stand up. 
I'm going to escort them to the door. I'm going to pick up my notes. Now, why? There's nothing on my notes that neither one of them don't already know. We've gone through party's opening statement. They were, well, they were both physically there anyways. We've gone through joint discussion, and it might have gotten a little heated, but any notes, uh, notes I've taken, they were both a part of that. So what am I hiding? Why do I leave my notes there? It's a good practice to pick up your notes and take them with you. Because particularly in the transition between the two caucuses, you really don't want to leave your notes with the party alone. It's a pretty big temptation to read your notes. There may be nothing in there to fear. There may be nothing in there that's volatile. But I have no idea how they're going to take my notes. I may have jotted something down, put a star next to something, put a question mark next to something. If they start questioning this, they start questioning me, they get suspicious, trust starts to waver a little bit. It's just not worth it. It's, so much more e it's just so much easier to pick up my notes and take them with me. Get in the habit. They're your notes. Keep them with you. When you leave this table, your notes leave this table as well. Now, how far do I escort them? I'm not just going to take them to the door and pull it shut. I don't want them standing outside the door, right? I'm going to take them to a waiting area, someplace that I've already identified because I've showed up 30 minutes early, remember? Now, and I'm also communicating to them, here's a waiting area. This is where I'm going to come and retrieve you. In other words, don't go wandering about the building somewhere because when I come back, I want to find you here. And it, sometimes it may be off a distance. I've, um, I've done uh, mediation postal facilities where the break room for the employees was down a hall to the left from the, where we were having our mediation. I walk that person all the way to that waiting area and leave, uh, leave them there, letting them know that uh, I'll be back here in just a few minutes. I'll also throw in the line, please don't associate any significance to the amount of time I may spend in a caucus. In other words, you may be sitting here for a while. Please don't take any reflection on that about you. It just may take me a little bit longer to deal with these. And I'll say that to both parties, uh, just to kind of make them feel a little bit more comfortable. What you don't want is a party sitting there and 20 minutes later, you know, now they're frustrated and they're pounding on your door. What are you guys doing in there? All right, I've addressed it a little bit about the time sequence. So I've left the party there. I've come back into the room. And now's the time you also want to pay attention to hooks. Hooks are where the, uh, the party that you're with, and usually it's when you're with them alone, they are going to try to do something to get you to their side. Now, when I think of a hook, I think of a fish hook, you know, where they're going to, you know, pull you one way or the other. Or the, um, the uh, shepherd's staff, you know, it has the hook, they're going to pull you in. That's what a hook does, and that's what they're trying to do, and it can take many forms. Um, for instance, I can be escorting the person to that break area, and along the way, silence. People aren't real comfortable with silence, and so they say something. Can you believe what a jerk that guy is? Can, you, know, you can see why I have so, much, so many problems in our department. See what I have to deal with as a supervisor? Oh, I just, and they're starting to say things to entice you to agree with them, to get on their side. Or, more often than not, where I usually get a hook is when I'm walking back into the room. I've got a party who's been sitting here, you know, maybe a minute, nah, probably not even that long, and I'm about to sit back down in my chair. And I'm just about settled in, and here it comes, the hook. Can you believe that supervisor? Can you see what a jerk he is? Now you know what I have to, don't I have a strong case? Do you think I'll win this? Some comment, some question that tries to get me on their side. Well, there are many ways to deal with a hook. And we'll, you're going to use your LLI, your lowest level of intervention. The, the thing I use most effectively and most often is ignore it. And it really works well if as I'm sitting down, they throw a hook at me, I've got my transition into the caucus I'm just about to say. So what I'll do is I'll sit down, turn my chair, face them, and go right into my spiel as though they said nothing at all. If it is a barb, if it is a little thing that was brought about because they were uncomfortable with the silence, they'll never bring it up again. And we just keep going. Don't even stop to address it. Occasionally, I finish my transition, a party will lean forward and say, I ask you a question uh, you know, about the su supervisor. Don't you think they're a jerk? 
then I have to point blank address it. And I'll go back to, we, we've discussed this and we cover it in more detail in uh, troubleshooting. I'm going to address my role here. My role here is as a third party neutral. You know, what I think about the supervisor, what I think about your case really isn't important. What's critically important is what you think, and now I'm right back into their lab. What do you want to do next? What do you want to, I'm back to my transition. Okay, we're back into caucus. If it happens in the hallway while I'm walking, I can do the same thing. I can ignore it. Just keep the silence and keep walking. Or I can use a simple line that reflects feeling. Remember, communication skills. I can see that this is a difficult situation for both of you. Or I can see that this is a difficult situation. Kind of a non-committal statement that gives a polite response without any commitment. Okay? So in terms of escorting them out, take your notes. Take them all the way to the waiting area so they know where they're going to be supposed to be, and then watch those hooks. Now, I'm sitting down. I'm going to turn my chair. We're about to start the caucus. And here's what I'm going to say. This is our caucus time. It's a time for you. And if you don't like the word caucus, this is our private meeting time. This is an opportunity for us to meet privately and talk about anything else that you might have wanted to talk about that maybe you felt uncomfortable with addressing when the other party was in the room. Okay. I'm going to review confidentiality. If you remember my opening statement, this is a conf can be a confidential setting. So I'm going to rehearse, review that again. Uh, anything we talk about can be confidential. Now, I've emphasized that for an important reason. I've seen a lot of enthusiastic mediators sit down during the caucus and go, and this is confidential. A lot of negotiations, a lot of big time agreements can, can pivot on little words like is, the, and. Well, this is one of those points where it's a big difference between is confidential and can be confidential. I want to recommend that you use the word can be or the phrase can be confidential because if you sit there and tell the party, this is confidential, then in essence what you've said, anything we talk about, I can't share. It's just between us. Your hands are tied now when it comes to getting back together with the other party. You can't talk about anything that you've discussed in caucus. The material then becomes useless. You kind of hamstring the process in terms of moving them through the option generating uh, part of this process and need exploration so that they can make their informed decisions. So can be confidential opens it up a little bit more. In other words, what we're going to talk about is a private meeting. Share with me anything you want because it can be confidential. And I'll ask you at the end, is there anything we've discussed you do not want me to bring up when the other party gets back or when we get back together in reconvening? So let's go over the transition smoothly all the way through one more time. This is our caucus time. It's an opportunity for us to meet privately together, talk about anything that you want to, maybe something you didn't feel comfortable talking about while the other party was in the room. And it can be confidential. Anything that we talk about need not be brought up when we get back together or with the other party, when I'm with the other party in the room. And I'll ask you at the end, is there anything we've talked about you do not want me to discuss or bring up? If not, then is there anything then that, uh, anything else you wanted to cover, maybe you didn't feel comfortable with, and if not, we'll go over your joint discussion or your opening statement notes. That's my transition. That gets the conversation started, the discussion. I've asked them a question. I've given them some uh, framework in which to work with. I've assured them that this can be confidential, hopefully to create that sense that they can be candid, they can be honest, they can be open, because it need not go anywhere else outside this room. And if not, you don't have anything else you want to add, and most of the times that's what they say. They turn around and, and go, no, I mean, that's, I don't have anything else to, to say. Um, you know, I, I said everything I wanted to say to their face, you know, something like that. Occasionally I'll get something that, well, there is one thing that I didn't want to share in front of them, and then they go into this big, long emotional spiel. If that's the case, notice I've succeeded in starting the conversation. The transition works, okay? What I'm going to do now in this conversation is start to do need exploration. And we have a whole presentation on that, so I'm not going to go back into all the details 
in terms of that. But this is what's happening in the caucus time. I am generating a conversation, a discussion one-on-one -on -one with this party in order to do need exploration. So the type of questions I'm asking, remember in our question asking skill uh, presentation, I'm asking the application analysis type questions. I don't need to ask the type of questions that get me back into the past necessarily. Although if you remember the arrow, we may spend some time there. I'm moving through the present and I want to get into the future. So I'm asking application analysis type questions in order to move this thing along, move it in a forward looking direction, again, probing the future. And I want to move from positions and interests. We go into great detail with this in the uh, need exploration, but basically, if you'll recall, that has to do with positions are belief-based statements and are usually associated with the past. Interests are need-based statements, right, need exploration, and they are usually centered into the future, what I want to see happen. That's a future-oriented uh, comment or concept. We're gonna, what do you want to see happen here today, tomorrow, whatever? We're looking into the future. So I want to move them from positions to interest. I'm going to do that by asking the application analysis type questions. And I want to be able to move from a single solution mindset. Uh, again, we addressed that in the uh, need exploration. But as a reminder, single solution mindset, each party comes to this table with a solution in mind based upon how they understand the past, based upon how they've organized the data and information, based upon where they are in their own personal uh, balance state that we talked about, then they have a solution. See, the problem here at this table isn't that there's not a solution. The problem is that they both have a solution. That's the difficulty. They have a solution, they have a solution. So if you walk in in a problem-solving mode and, hey, I got an idea, let's do this and offer another solution, you've only muddied the waters. Your expertise in problem-solving skills adds one more solution. Now, great, instead of having two, we have three. Now how are we going to negotiate this thing out? The idea isn't to add more solutions. The idea is to move from a single solution mindset by doing need exploration. All right, so that's what need exploration, this is where it happens. That's what I'm doing with this conversation with this person. In the need uh, exploration and uncovering their needs, then I'm going to be able to go from there to generating options. Now, generating options works like this. The only data that I have available to me at this table is what the parties bring. And they brought it to me in the form of their opening statement and joint discussion. Now, I've done an excellent joint discussion. I've really used my notes effectively. We've done the, the power of the present focus. And now I'm going to base the information on that to move into the what ifs. Okay? I have this person alone. They've told me several things in joint discussion. I've asked questions to get an idea of what's important to them. And now we're alone. And I can play with each and every one of those ideas that I got from joint discussion that they gave me or I've deduced or have been implied. The what if is the devil advocacy kind of thing. I'm going to ask the questions like, what if you get what you want? What if you get what you're asking for or you don't get what you're asking for? Um, let me play devil's advocate here for a moment. You've asked for the suspension to be dropped. I wonder if you could share with me what impact it would have on you if the suspension is not dropped. What are you going to do today if she says yes? What are you going to do today if she says no? So I can play out a range of possibilities because it's in developing those ranges that I generate options. They begin to think outside the box. We start to move beyond that single solution mindset because I'm doing the what ifs, I'm playing the devil advocate, I'm probing, I'm exploring the, the, the scenario that they've asked for. Be careful what you ask for, possibly. And what does it really mean to them? And then there, I can move to, there's my options. So let me give an example. If I ask, let's say an employee's got a two-day suspension, and what we've uncovered, and it's come up in joint discussion, and now we get to explore it in caucus, is they want the suspension dropped. All right? There's my JD data. Now I'm going to move into the what ifs. Well, let me ask you, uh, Susan, John, whoever it is, um, 
what impact is it going to have in your life if the suspension isn't dropped? I know you've asked for the suspension to be dropped, and I don't know what the supervisor might ultimately say. Uh, they seemed a little resistant to, during joint discussion, but if the end result here today is the suspension stays, what impact will that have on your life? The next thing they say will generally point to your needs. Now, not every time. You may have to push this a little bit deeper. Most of the time when I ask this, I get, uh, you know, what impact is it going to have? Well, it wasn't fair. It should have never happened. Uh, from the very beginning, this has been bad. You know, I deserved it. That was, I handled uh, terribly. That's the past. I said, well, yeah, I can understand that, you know, you're frustrated about this. But I'm curious, if it doesn't go away, if it's not removed, how will that affect you? Now, if they say, well, I can't afford a two-day suspension, then I know that their need and their concern revolves around cash, money. And now my questions and the development of options will revolve around the issues of money. So two days pay is costly to you, is that correct? Yes. Well, how much is two days? Okay. Is there any other way to get, make up that money? Somewhere else, somehow, some way. Okay. Start taking the focus off the suspension and then we move it to money. What if I ask the question about impact and the response is, I can't, it'll end up in my file and my, it'll hurt my promotion chances and it'll hurt my um, evaluations. Then I know it has something to do with their personnel file. It has something to do about their promotion. My questions and generating options will now revolve the what ifs around the file, personnel, promotions, timetables, things like that. I don't need to ask money questions if it's about file, and I don't need to ask file questions if it's about money. So the what ifs, that generating options, I take the data, ask the questions, and then from there, develop my options. So let's take our notes that we've done. We've been working with this non-selection scenario. We've gone through the note taking in uh, party's opening statement. We've gone through that present focus with uh, the notes in joint discussion. Now we're going to use those to move into options and generate concerns. If you recall, the uh, C's concerns were basically around three things. I've been talking to them, we've had a conversation, we've having this discussion, and the concerns fall in these areas. He wants this promotion to the GS-12 level. Notice he's at a GS-9. Remember that from our previous uh, scenario? Now, the question mark is there for me. Can you move from a GS-9 to a GS-12? Is that possible? My experience, and probably not, and, but how do I approach that? Do I sit here during my first conversation and go, well, uh, tell me, John, is, is that something that can be done? I don't have to head this, take this issue head on. The GS9 information I might be able to get from the respondent when we get back together and reconvening. I need to find out what they know, what they don't know. Can they, has this ever been done? I've, I'm curious. Oh, yeah, it happens all the time. Oh, yeah, it's easy to do. Oh, the agency. I've heard this from, from complainants. The company can do anything they want. You know? So obviously, yeah, there's not a position. But if they want to, they can create one for me. That guy didn't get the position. In that case, didn't settle. But that's what he was saying. So the GS9, I don't necessarily have to raise it. Um, but the questions I ask will uncover from concerns to his interests. We'll get to that more in a minute. Number two, my evaluation and my attendance should count for something. There's something going on there in his concern. He said this several times. He keeps repeating it. This is a concern for him. And the last one, he's concerned about office morale. This is what has come out of, let's say, the JD data and the discussion. So I need to move from his concerns to his interests. Notice, after I've talked to him for a while, here's what we uncover. The promotion concern revolves around responsibilities and challenge. See, here's what happens. And I picked a non-selection scenario for just this reason. They're often cited as the hardest cases to do. And when we end up doing advanced trainings, we end up doing other uh, circumstance situations, Everyone raises their hand and say, you know, how do you do a non-selection? So I picked this one here for this purpose because this is a step. If the need exploration is not done and the options generation is not done, 
this can be a very complicated case because all you have at your disposal is you either fire K, who got the position, and give it to, to the complainant, or the complainant is just out of luck. Those are not enough options to deal with effectively in an empowering moment making informed decisions. I need other options. So here's what I do. I ask the what if, I ask the impact questions, the application analysis questions to, to the complainant, and I say, what's going to happen if you don't get this promotion? I mean, we've hired somebody, Kay's got it, she's already moved in, got the desk set up. I mean, what, what impact is it going to have on you if you don't get this promotion? And what I hear is, as a result, it could say a number of different things. But for this example, to make our point, well, my job is, is getting to be a drag. There's no challenge. I'm, I'm really good at what I do. I've been in the agency for a long time. I know this, this job backwards and forwards. I need more of a challenge. I need more responsibility. And that job would have given it to me. What have I heard? Is it about GS-12? or is about having challenge and responsibility. If it's about GS-12, the only option I have is, well, can we fire K? No. End of mediation. But if it's about responsibility and challenge, is there any other way to create responsibility and challenge for the complainant that has nothing to do with K's position? Yes, there are. And that's the way you're going to start to judge. Well, what options are there available? I can ask the complainant next. What kind of responsibilities? What kind of challenges? What is it you, you, know, you want that would feel challenging to you? And he gets to outline for me what this looks like. He's also informed me that he's got his own personal timetable, a deadline that he's working on. This is self-imposed, he tells me. He wants to be at a certain level in his career at X, Y, and Z date. And he's behind schedule. This opportunity came up, looked perfect for him. He felt he deserved it, could have got it, and now he's set back in his timetable. What I find out in my conversations for generating options, and developing need exploration, and evaluation attendance, he doesn't feel valued. <laughs> he's been two years here, perfect attendance, does everything that anybody's ever asked, goes the extra, extra mile, comes early, stays late, we all have employees like that, right? They come early. Stay. Never mind. And now what he's feeling like is all that was just shoved aside and some outsider was given my job. Okay. So he's feeling, not feeling value. So I can, it sounds to me like eh, you're not really feeling appreciated. You've really put forth the extra effort here and it's been ignored. Huh, not only ignored, it's been trashed. Ah. So if there was some way for you to feel valued, appreciated? Is there anything your supervisor could do that would help you feel valued? Now they get to think about it. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, if, if she would just tell me. Well, here in public, in writing, on the marquee, in front of the company, I mean, you know, do we build banners? How do you, and I can start to do these what ifs each time, each level creates the options. And the last one he's concerned about, morale, morale in the office. And maybe with a little smile, he recognizes he's contributing to this a little bit. Maybe not. But he's still concerned about the office environment. So he wants to talk about that. So now, I've actually uncovered interests out of his concerns. And now we go into, I have his agenda. These are the things he wants to talk about when we get back together. These are the things that are most important to him. Notice, I've generated an agenda that has three items on it. Response challenge he wants to talk about when we get back together with his supervisor. He wants to talk about feeling valued, and he wants to talk about morale. What's missing from that list? Notice the timetable deadline's not on there. It's a concern, but he may not be interested in talking about it, especially in front of the supervisor. He's willing to talk about it to me. It may not even be confidential, but it's not something he needs for her to know about his personal timetable. Notice, it hasn't ended up on the agenda because we've talked about it. Is that something you want to talk about when she comes? Responsibility and challenge seems like it's very important to you. Is that something you want to talk about? Is, are you willing to share that with her when she gets back in? Yes, I'm willing to share that. This timetable deadline thing, is that something you're willing to talk to her about? No, I just don't see that as being important. Off the list. Not maybe on, maybe off. He gets to decide. 
I've developed an agenda. Are you willing to talk about these things? Are you willing to share this with her? Yes, yes, yes. I've got an agenda of three items. That agenda is critically important for the negotiations we set up in reconvening. The transition now. I've got my agenda. It happens to be three points. Could be ten, but it happens to be three for this illustration. Okay? And the caucus is over. How am I going to transition out? I'm going to end my every caucus with these, this phrase. Is there anything else you want to discuss? Anything else that's important to you? Anything else that we haven't discussed already that's important to you? Nope, nothing else. Okay, then I'll summarize. Well, then here's the things we have talked about. We've talked about this, we've talked about that, we talked about responsibility, we talked about challenge, we talked about timetable, we talked about uh, feeling valued, we talked about the morale in the office. And the things you want to talk about when, when we get back together and reconvening are responsibility, challenge, feeling valued, and morale. Okay? Yes. Now, is there anything, and I'm going to review confidentiality one last time at the end of Complainants Caucus. Is there anything we've talked about? I've summarized what we've talked about. I've gone over the list of the agenda again. Is there anything we've talked about that you do not want me to raise when she comes back in the room? Yes, no, whatever it is. My recommendation is to not write it down. Well, don't tell her I, I called her a jerk. Don't tell her I wanted to, to shave her head and run her through the cafeteria in a thong. Leave that stuff off. Don't write it down. Just, okay, I won't say that. 99% of the time, what they ask you not to say, you wouldn't say anyways, because you knew it would only heat things up and, and cause problems. So just forget about them completely. Don't write them down. If you write them down, you run the risk of somebody reading them or seeing it. Uh, you don't have to write it down to remember, necessarily. So review confidentiality. So the transition. Is there anything else we've talked about? I mean, anything else you want to talk about that we haven't covered? No. OK. Then here's what we have talked about. Here's what we're going to talk about when we get back together. And is there anything we've talked about you don't want me to raise when we get back together? No. I'm done. Fine. OK, then let me escort you out. And now I'm going to escort the complainant out. What am I going to do? Take my notes. I'm going to escort them all the way to the waiting room because that's where I'm going to pick up the respondent. So hey, that's a nice exchange. Leave one, pick up one. And then I'm also, again, going to watch for the hooks, either on the way or for the respondent. Well, here's what I often hear, either when I'm just about to sit down with the respondent or walking back. Well, what would you guys talk about? You. No, I never say that. Um, well, that took a long time. You know, boy, he must really have a lot of things he's demanding, something like that. Again, ignore it. If you have to make a comment, we can discuss those things when we get back into the mediation room. My role here is a third party. We've given you several lines to effectively deal with those. So we're watching the hooks. We're sitting down. And now we're into starting the discussion. Same procedure I used with the complainant. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to turn, I'm going to ignore any hooks I've gotten, and start right into my spiel. This is our caucus time. Remember, I said the same thing to the complainant. This is our caucus time. It's a time for us to meet privately and for you to talk about anything else that you want to talk about that maybe you didn't feel comfortable talking about while the other party was in the room. And it can be confidential. Anything we talk about need not be brought up again when the other party comes back in the room. Okay. Then I'm going to ask them, is there anything else that you want to talk about that maybe you weren't comfortable with? If not, we'll go over the joint discussion material. And now I've started the discussion. And again, just like the complainant, they'll either go back, yes, no, whatever it is. If they say no, I jump into the joint discussion. One of the things you talked about, and I'm looking through my notes, one of the things you talked about in the joint discussion was the morale. I'll talk about something, and we'll get this conversation started. So then what am I going to do? Out of this conversation, I'm going to be developing, finding out their concerns. Remember, the JD data I've got, the concerns ended up being she's concerned about morale for a number of different reasons. We're going to talk about what her interests are out of her concerns. She's also concerned that Kay's got the job. This is her choice. Give Kay a chance. This is the thing she wants. This is the stuff she's given me out of my joint discussion. And drop the EEO complaint. That's what's most important to her. So now I've done the what ifs. I've done the exploring around each of these. And what I end up coming to then 
is the respondent's interests. Okay? Out of the office morale, what's of concern to her? The office morale. Why? Why is that bothering her? What impact is it having? Remember those impacts? What if the morale doesn't change? What's going to happen? What if it does change? What's going to happen? Getting these impact kind of questions to uncover need. I find out she's concerned about how she looks to her boss. Well, of course she is. The, Whatever is happening, the morale, the productivity in the office reflects on her. She's concerned about her job. Okay? I've got an interest. Give Kay a chance. What does that mean? Why? What's it this is her choice. She's made this choice. She thinks it's a good one for the company and the department. It's also a reflection on her. So she wants support. If the complainant would just support Kay and me, right, she's saying, now which one actually going to come out in the conversation? Is she going to bluntly come right out and tell the complainant, I need you to support me? Maybe, maybe not. But the other opportunity is for her to at least communicate, would you be willing to support Kay? I don't know how she'll formulate this when we get it together, uh, get together as a group, but we're also going to, I'm going to work with her on some of that. Maybe ask some of those questions. How do you want to present this? How do you want to deal with it? And then dropping the EEO. What's her interest there? <laughs> Nobody wants to go through an EEO. She's been through this before. It's bad for the department. It causes bad feelings. Productivity goes down. It's a lengthy process. Those are her interests. So I now can generate her agenda. Her agenda becomes support K and her. The department, talking about morale here, and especially uh, the complainant's attitude. She wants to address that. These things all need to be addressed when we get back together. And I'll ask her, are you willing to ask him if he'll support K? Yeah, I'll ask him. I'll talk to him about why that's important. Okay. In the department, morale, the things you mentioned, what you'd like to see, X, Y, Z, you know, because I've asked and painted the picture. Each one of these, I've worked with the parties in developing the need to paint a concrete picture. Paint a concrete picture. You don't paint with concrete. You can paint on concrete. I'm going to paint a picture as clear as can be so that they know exactly what they're looking for. They know exactly what they're going to talk about because I've asked the questions. I'm also going to turn around and ask her, well, I don't know what he might say. And I can do this, also, I'll do this with a complainant as well. But what if he says he's willing to drop the EEO, but he's not willing to support K? The answer she gives me gives me some sense of the priority she has on each of these issues. How important are they to her? Is it more important to drop the EEO even if she doesn't get the support for K or for herself? She may say, well, as long as the EEO gets dropped, that's the most important thing. Or she may say, no, I need that support. If the department's not um, moving in a forward direction, EEO or no EEO, I still look bad. Okay, it, it tells me it's important there. What if he's willing to support K, but not willing to drop the EEO? See, I can ask, a, if this is a list of 10 items, I can ask this prioritizing question in order to identify what's most important to the party. And it helps them to think through, in terms of their options, what is most important to me? How will I respond if he says yes, if he says no? Okay? So that's why caucus is probably the longest step in any of the, of the mediation process steps. It's longest because I'm spending this time with this individual. We're dealing with past data. We're working on generating options. And I'm asking all of these what-if questions. That lays the foundation for an informed decision-making process. They know exactly. She's going to be able to think exactly. Well, if he says, no, I thought about that. Here's what I'm going to say. Because this is more important to me than this is. And he's going, she's going to effectively be able to negotiate, which is what we're about to do in reconvening. So I've got her agenda. Now, how am I going to end her caucus? Same way. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Have we covered everything that's important to you? Yes, no, add things, subtract things. In this particular case, for this example, yes, we've covered everything. There are three items. Here's what we've talked about. Okay. There are three things that you want to talk about with him when we get back together, correct? Okay. And is there anything we've talked about you do not want me to bring up when we get back together? No, nope. everything's fine. 
I have nothing to hide. I hear that a lot. I have nothing to hide. So we're finished. One more step now for her caucus. I'm going to introduce C's agenda to the supervisor. Now, he has an agenda of three items. And here's what I'm going to do, and here's how I'm going to word it. If there's nothing else, see, I've finished the respondent's caucus. Now, let me do it to a sidebar here. One of the major mistakes that mediators, new mediators in particular, make is they skip the respondent's caucus. Notice what I hope you will see through this process that we're going through is I did exactly with the respondent what I did with the complainant. In terms of steps, they were identical. I gave the complainant a respondent and it generated the options I needed. It produced what needed to be produced that the, this process step calls for. I need the same thing from the respondent. Here's the mistake that's often made. I get an agenda from C, I send them out, I retrieve the respondent, and I sit down and say, here's what's important to C, and I dump the agenda on the respondent. And then I end it with, and what are you willing to do with it? Are you willing to address the responsibility challenge? Are you willing to, do you know that he feels bad? Do you know that he doesn't feel appreciated? Do you think it would improve the morale in the office if you would show some appreciation? What am I doing? I'm browbeating the respondent. I've also communicated in a not so subtle way that the most important thing here at this table today is the complainant. And I've hamstrung good negotiations. What you're going to see when we get into reconvening is that the negotiation starts there, not here. And the negotiation revolves completely around both their agendas. I ruin all of that if I do not generate options and I do not do need exploration for the respondent. So critically important, do the same caucus over here for the respondent. The only thing different in the steps are now at the end, notice I've finished the respondent's caucus. Is there anything else? Summarize, review confidentiality. Last step. If there's nothing else, there are a few things C wanted to discuss with you, or John, or whoever it is, wanted to discuss with you when we get back together. My goal with this step in introducing the agenda is one thing. Determine her willingness to discuss those items. And it sounds something like this. One of the things C um, brought up was a concern about responsibility and challenge. He would like to talk to you about some more responsibility and more challenging tasks. Is that something you would be willing to discuss with him? That's all I want to find out. She goes, well, what does he mean? Well, he's got some more things to, to share. I mean, he's willing to talk about that, and he can answer those questions for you. That might be a good question to ask him. What I want to know now is if you're willing to discuss it with him. Oh, yeah, I'm willing to discuss it with him. I just didn't, you know, I just wanted to know more information. Well, when we get back together, that can be a conversation you two can have. See the emphasis shift? I'm not doing the negotiation. I'm not being an advocate for either party. All I've done is placed both agendas now on the table. She gets to think about it. Yes. I'll discuss with him responsibility and judge. A second thing he's mentioned that he wants to talk to you about was um, feeling valued in the department. Really? Well, that's the first I've heard of that. I often hear that comment uh, in a, in a, during a mediation. Well, that's the first time I've heard that. Well, you haven't been listening. <laughs> no, no. It's actually come out because the process has done, a well has done a good job in terms of creating and generating options. What I want to know well, that's the first time I've heard that. Is that something you'd be willing to discuss with him? Yeah, I'll talk to that about him. Uh, why is he feeling bad? Well, that's a good question to ask him. I think he, he might be willing to discuss that with you. He said this was important to him. But you're willing to discuss it with him? Yes, okay. And the third item he wants to talk about is morale in the office. Pfft. Yeah, well, that's good to hear because he needs to do something about that. I'm concerned about morale too. So that does sound like something you're willing to talk to him about. Yeah, I'll talk to him about that. Okay, so then when we get back together, and I'm going to gently introduce what we're going to do next. This is kind of a precursor into the reconvening. So I'm going to go get him. 
We'll get back together. We'll discuss his items that are important to him and the items that are important to you. Now, the last thing, I'm going to close the caucus, and the caucus step is finished now. I'm going to close it with a final quick review with her confidentiality. Because we've talked about a few more things. I don't know how much more she said. I don't know how long this conversation about willingness to discuss may go. But I'm going to briefly cover one more time, just for protection, because this is confidentiality is critically important. So I'm going to end. So you are willing to discuss these with him. Well, I'm going to go retrieve him. We'll get back together. We'll go over his items of concern, and then we'll go over your items of concern as well. I want to make sure, is there anything else we've talked about you do not want me to bring up? No, I'm fine. Okay, then let me go get him. And I pick up my notes, and I go get the complainant. I bring the complainant back in, sit down, and we begin our reconvening together. We were now going into the offering of mutual gains. Here's where the negotiations take place, where they each get to share each other's agenda. There are ways to do that that can facilitate and lead to a good agreement. Next step, reconvening together. See you there.